Okay, so first of all, the European Student Chapter is very proud and also very happy to have this webinar today together with our two great speakers. So I think we can't get better speakers for this topic. So we have um, Dr. Lynn Philippe conaway Maybe some of you know her from ACES. She was the past president of the Association of Information Science and Technology. And um, our second um, speaker is Professor Mary L. Redford from the Rutgers University in New Jersey. And both have so much experience with um, conducting researches, with doing surveys, and at this point from the whole European student chapter, we would to thank them. And we also thank everyone who participate right now. Hello everyone, this is Lynn Filipini Conaway. Thank you for joining us. Um, Marie and I will be talking about the survey research today. And Marie and I co-authored the uh, book research methods for library and information science that was published in 2017. So a lot of what we're saying today was taken from that uh, publication. So this is the agenda that we have developed for today. And we'll talk about some of the popular uh, library and information science research, research methods uh, that have been identified in the literature. And we will do um, talk about, obviously, survey research, um, the type, sampling, advantages, disadvantages, and design. Um, also, data analysis tools and methods. And we'll give some examples from a project that Marie and I uh, completed. And we had funding from the US government, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, we'll also address mixed methods research and uh, how to present the findings. Uh, and, and that's very important, because what do you do uh, once you collect all of these uh, data? So the most widely used methods in library and information science. Well, these are um, some of the, the data from 1950. So we're doing this historically from 1950 through 1975. And we've highlighted the top research methods identified in the literature. And you'll see that uh, number one is survey or experiment on libraries. And then next are historical methods. And third, information system design. And fourth, theoretical analytical pieces. And then surveys on the public. So surveys on the public were quite um, uh, lower than the others. Now remember, you have to put this in perspective. Uh, this was the past. And so information system design was very popular and also experiments with these systems. Now when we look at the Journal of Documentation from 2000 to 2010, and, and Shu published this uh, article in 2015. Uh, when Shu reviewed 367 documents, uh, you can see that 38% of them did, uh, used the theoretical approach, so those theory, theoretical pieces. Um, where they're developing new theories, discussing um, how we can use different methods, that type of thing. Content analysis was in 14% of them. Questionnaires, very close, 13.8%. Experiment, 13.4%. And interviews, 13.4%. Now, Chu also looked at the research methods used in the journal um, of the Association for Information Science and Technology, or JASIS, from 2001 to 2010. And there were 554 articles that were reviewed for this. Um, experiment was first, uh, bibliometrics, following, questionnaire, content analysis, and then the theoretical approach. So you see that there are some um, themes that keep appearing. Now, 
bibliometrics appeared uh, in JSIS. And one of the things that you have to remember when you're looking at the research methods published in different journals is um, the editor and the editorial board, because they often uh, determine the direction of the journal. When you look at li the journal Library and Information Science Research, or LISR, from 2001 to 2010, uh, to examine 241 articles. And again, you see content analysis, questionnaire comes in second, interviews, theoretical approach, and experiment. So these same themes keep reappearing. When uh, This is Lou and McKinney in 2015. And they looked at the Journal of Academic Library, Librarianship and from 2004 to 2013. And questionnaires came up number one, 47.6%. Um, they looked at 346 papers. And um, diaries were included under questionnaires, which is a little bit odd, but anyway, they were included there, as are um, tests or quizzes. You also see the content analysis and then semi-structured interviews. Um, again, the same themes uh, reappearing. Now I'll talk a little bit about survey research because that's why we're here today. Uh, and survey research has many advantages. You are able to um, really study many aspects of service and perceptions of users and of, of individuals. You can collect demographic information. You can control the sampling because you only distribute to those who are, you are interested in studying. You usually get a high response rate. Not always, but the response rate can often be high because individuals can do this on their own time. They're not having to schedule to meet with you, talk with you. And some individuals don't want to meet with you and talk to you. Uh, the, the data reflect the individual's opinions, perceptions, their characteristics. It can be very cost effective. Um, we used to put, you know, put things in the post, in the mail, uh, the surveys, and so that you would have to pay for postage. But now many of these are done um, online. Uh, you can self-administer them. You can survey large numbers of individuals. And with the online uh, survey systems, um, uh, software packages and things that are available, such as SurveyMonkey, they can also provide the statistical analysis. So these are a lot of the advantages of surveys. Some of the disadvantages, surveys only provide a snapshot of that specific situation, whatever you're asking about. They can be time consuming to analyze and interpret the results, especially if you have open-ended questions. And many times we want open-ended questions and they take more time than the yes, no, the like or scale, the true false questions. Um, again, it's self-reported data. So individuals are telling you what they think or what they may think you want to hear or their perceptions. It may not be the actuality of what is happening. But that is true with almost any type of data collection method. Uh, it, the surveys lack that, that depth of interviewing. When you're interviewing someone and they say something interesting or they're not answering your question, you can probe and you can get back in there and get more information. Or if it's something really interesting, you say, aha, I want to know more about that. Um, again, I, I said that you can have a very high return, but sometimes it, a high return rate can be difficult. And if you get about one third of response rate uh, in a survey, right now that's pretty high. Why? Because we're inundated often with surveys. Um, we're inundated with email, with text messages. So these are things that you um, have to consider when thinking of survey research methods. 
There are different types of surveys, and I alluded to that already. There's the exploratory survey, uh, where you, you as the researcher want to become more familiar with the topic. Uh, you want to clarify your concept so you don't know enough, and you're trying to find out more, and the literature doesn't provide more information for you. This is a way of directing your future research. So then you may follow up with interviews or an experiment. So we call this the exploratory survey. Then we have the descriptive survey. Uh, this is the survey that has um, the, the analytical surveys. So we get a lot of demographic information. Uh, you also can use these to estimate the proportions in the population who say they do something a certain way or believe us in a certain thing. It can help you make predictions on how individuals are responding to certain situations. You can also test uh, relationships. So those, um, you know, the if then, that type of thing. And explore causal relationships. And that's a little tricky with anything, but you still can uh, try to explore that cause and effect. Now sampling, uh, and this could be a whole webinar in itself. So we have non-probability sampling and probability sampling. There are different types of non-probability sampling. It's that accidental sample where you know it just happens. Uh, you get what you get. You have the quota sample that you're trying to get um, some type of proportions within a population. You have that snowball sample. That's whenever I may interview Marie and then say, Hey, Marie, are there other people like you who I could interview or talk to or send this survey to? And so then it snowballs. You just gather people from others. The purpose of sample, you have very specific types, characteristics, individuals who you want to survey. And so there, that, that is the purpose of sample. It's not random, um, as, and random meaning willy-nilly, um, with anyone. No specific characteristics will take anyone. Um, there's the, the self-selected sample where you send out, you can send out an email or you can be in, in a group and say, hey, if you're interested in participating in this survey and maybe putting your name in to win um, uh, an iPhone, uh, please go to this link or contact us. And um, so, and then you have the, an incomplete sample, which is, um, again, um, a, this non-probability sample where uh, you may be missing some individuals from the population. With the probability sampling, this is um, much more systematic. You can use um, the simple random sample. Uh, and you have the systematic so, sampling. I think she will be you have there stratified random sampling. Seconds. So if you want to stratify by ages or some type of characteristics or geographical locations, and you want certain percentages from each, and then you have the, the cluster sampling. Uh, the, I wanted to go over a checklist for designing surveys. And uh, this came uh, from, a lot of this came from Joe Jaynes, um, and I don't see this on the slide on this attribution, uh, and in a, an article that, that was published in Library High Tech in 1999. And it talks about good questions. And good questions basically are those questions related to the problem or to your research. So very direct. Um, questions that relate to what you are studying. Uh, you can have multiple choice. As I said, you can have open-ended. You can have Likert scale. The questions need to be very clear, very precise, and unambiguous, which can be very difficult. Uh, I talk to many people, and they all the first thing that comes to mind, oh, we'll do a survey, thinking that surveys are very easy. Good surveys are not easy to develop. 
you are not there as an individual researcher able to explain or probe to those who are answering the questions. So you've got to be sure you're asking the questions in a way that will get you the answers that you need. Also, um, the, the questions have to be answerable. So if the individuals who are answering the questions have no idea of how to answer this question, then you're going to waste your time and their time and not get the information that you need. They call the um, don't use double-barreled questions. That's that um, using and. So when you're putting multiple questions together. So, um, and I've seen this on surveys many times. So instead of breaking it up into two questions, we will have multiple questions within one question. And that's very difficult for people to answer and very difficult to code. You want the questions to be short and to the point. Try not to use negative language, so turn it around. Um, and I've noticed that a lot, when people will use this um, more negative language, which can often be a turn off. And you do not want biased questions. And I see this a lot when they send out questions for political surveys. And you'll see that the way the questions are worded, it's almost as though the researchers are guiding you to answer in a way that they want you to answer. So they, it's almost pre-designed to get the answers that they want. And, and this is something that can be done in any type of research. Now, when designing this, you can go, as I said, paper or online. A survey monkey seems to be one that's very popular. You need to consider the order of the questions, the sequencing. Do they, does this order make sense? Do these questions, um, are they more linear? Do they follow along um, the way individuals would think about what you're asking them? You can also have demographic questions. If so, have that first. Something we've been doing lately is when we invite people to participate into a survey, we give them a link to a Google Doc, and then in that Google document, they answer the demographic question. And then we can use that information for, for our sampling. And so then if we want X number of individuals who are within this age range, living within this region, experts in, within this area or discipline, then we have our sampling frame right there. And so I really have been liking, I, I like that a lot, and I like doing that a lot. And then if the individuals participate in your survey, you can link that demographic information to their responses, and you don't have to ask those questions again. Be very specific with your instructions. Introduce each section, because if you have different sections, Introduce it. Let them know you're moving to the, uh, another area. Keep it simple because you want people to respond. And if it's too difficult, you'll lose them. They won't complete the survey. And always pretest. And not just once. If you're making major revisions after a pretest, then you need to, to pretest again. And if you're making several revisions on that, pretest again. And I must say, we had to pretest one survey three times. And if that's what it takes, that's what you need to do. We were asking some very open, difficult, open-ended, lengthy questions. And so it took a lot for getting that um, out there. And we did get 150 responses, which was our goal. So doing, being um, prepared, doing thing, the design well, will really help uh, when you uh, are actually collecting and analyzing the data. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Marie, and she's going to talk about data analysis tools and methods. And Marie, just let me know when you're ready for me to change the slides. Well, that's difficult, but what we do 
is if uh, I talked about that pre-screening questionnaire and once an individual indicates that he or she wants to participate in an online survey, we send them a, sur a, a link to a survey. And they have, we don't use their email address anymore. So whenever they submit that, they have a, a code or a number. So it will be participant, say if it's an undergraduate student if we're doing, it would be participant U15. And that's how, and then we don't associate that individual's email address with any of the data we have collected. And one of the things that I did not mention is that we do not um, maintain, as I said, we don't maintain or link the email addresses with any of the information, but we also have to go, uh, before we conduct any of these surveys, um, any interviews, collect any data, we go through either a university, if I'm working with Rutgers, with Larry, Larry. we go through their institutional review board. When I was working at the University of Sheffield, we went through their ethics board. And so this, we go through all the checks and balances to be sure that, that the participants are, um, they are not being exploited and that their identity is not being shared. And we also have this at OCLC. As I said, one of the best ways to do that is to send a preliminary if it, um, survey with demographic information to individuals. So if I'm interested in participating in your, sur in your study, I click a link and you can develop your sampling frame from this, um, this survey, this initial survey. And it's a demographic survey in many ways. So if you want to talk to nine-year-olds about their summer reading programs at the public library, then you need to ask specific questions about that. And if you want them from certain regions of your country or certain regions globally, then you need to include those questions so that you can create your sampling frame. Once you get all the people submitting this information, then you can determine who you want to uh, survey and there's your sampling frame. So you are in control. So what Lynn was talking about with design uh, of surveys, one of the most important things to consider, I call it beginning with the end in mind. When you are designing your survey, and what you have to think about is what kind of data you're going to get. And then when you get that kind of data, how are you going to do the analysis? So in our previous poll, it looks like many of you are in this webinar to hear about designing uh, surveys. And if you have more design questions as we go through the webinar, please type them into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them. So, the, when you're thinking about design, uh, what kind of data do you want to get? And so we will be talking in this section of the webinar about uh, analyzing qualitative data, quantitative data, and then later on we will be talking about mixed methods. So if you think about surveys you have taken in the past, when you have all of the um, exact uh, answers, such as in our poll, in the poll that we took at the beginning, we are not allowing you to write in other responses, although a few of you did type them into the chat box, which was clever, right? <laughs> because in our survey, we gave you definitive 
uh, choices. Okay, so that kind of choices are very easily uh, analyzed, and as you saw in our polling software, we immediately got a type of descriptive um, descriptive statistics. We got immediately the numbers who answered everything, which answer, and we got percentages. So those are what you would call extremely low-level descriptive statistics. So one of the things to think about, too, is do you have the skills, if you're going to ask qualitative uh, questions, such as open-ended, tell us about your experiences with surveys and then we allow you to answer, that cannot be quickly analyzed by the descriptive uh, statistics. So we're going to start, at, Lynn, if you'll uh, move to the next screen, I'm going to start talking a little bit first about qualitative analysis. So ethnographic analysis allows you to ask those open-ended questions and will then um, uh, need you to actually look at the answers and construct a data um, analysis that allows you to use people's own categories that arise right out of the data itself that you haven't imposed uh, already, will uh, allow you not to assume what you will find. So one of the things with open-ended questions is that if you're not sure what the answers might be, Right? Uh, you might want to do open-ended questions to find out what are the range of possible questions. And so these qualitative uh, types of questions can complement quantitative methods, and I will talk more about them in a minute. Uh, the idea of maintaining richness and thick descriptions uh, of your data is one of the reasons to ask those qualitative uh, questions to begin with, and also these methods are not incompatible with numeric with numerical analysis. For example, uh, when you are asking open-ended questions and half the respondents use very similar words, you can then say that you know about 50% or half of the uh, half of the respondents did use that. But that's different from what Lynn was talking about, where you can have uh, your stats. Um, that are looking looking to pred make predictions uh, and 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 summarizing of large large samples. Uh, as Lynn was saying, the qualitative data and analysis is the most time consuming. So Lynn, if you move to the next slide, if we want to help ourselves with large amounts of qualitative data, we can use uh, computer assisted software. Uh, so generally what we see here is uh, this, this software does not do the data analysis for you. So unlike when we just ran that little, uh, those little polls where immediately the software computed, uh, you know, how many people answered each questions and the percentage, the qualitative data analysis software does not actually do that for you, you have to do the job of uh, the analysis in this way. Uh, so uh, what you would do there is you get all your data sources together, and then the most important thing is the creation and application of codes, right? So you will, you will start building a coding scheme and then you can, most of the programs allow you to drag and drop. So for example, uh, in vivo, is one of the most popular software, uh, which is the one that Lynn and I have been using for our very large data sets. There is also Atlas TI, which is another very popular uh, software program. There is also Deduce, D-E-D-O-O-S-E, -O -O -E, and Hyper Research. These are just some of them. We, ch we chose uh, in vivo, and we've been very happy with that because Lynn and I do work with very large uh, data sets. So this allows you to create and apply codes to large amount of data. Data it enables you to uh, to do queries to your data, which is to ask your data questions. At which point it will tell you it will do data reduction and return uh, information to you in in the form of reports. 
so you can see how many codes were applied, which ones were applied, and so forth, uh, and also develop visualizations. Another really important aspect that we find uh, really um, uh, two things I guess I want to talk about very valuable one is demographic data it allows you to um, uh, connect uh, say you want to know uh, say you did interviews with 50 women and 50 men okay it would allow you to uh, say well all the women said X for this or some of the women or what are the percentage of the women what are the results for the women as a demographic category as opposed to the men okay so you can take any of your demographic categories or you could do it with age or etc that's one huge advantage which is very difficult to do if you're doing this by hand manually where you are just highlighting and making notes about codes and even or using word uh, and comments and highlighting in Word, which, which you can do that if you have just a little bit of data, but if you have a lot of data, it gets very cumbersome. Also, if you change a code, if you change a code, it gets very cumbersome. The second huge advantage that Lynn and I have found is in uh, intercoder reliability. We use teams of coders, so we want to make sure we're all coding uh, the same, you know, similarly, and that we have good intercoder reliability, and uh, programs like Invivo will compute this for you very easily. At the end, also, you can do visualizations. It will help you to, to do charts, to do theoretical uh, visualizations, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, Lynn, if you go to the next slide, um, with ethnographic data in particular, you may be using a grounded theory approach. So the grounded theory doesn't start with all categories that already have been determined by previous research or perhaps by a pilot study. It draws on the data, develops new categories, uh, works inductively. Okay, and most of the time what we're looking to do with grounded theory is construct uh, theore theoretical approaches. So uh, this again, like what Lynn was saying about sampling, we could do an entire webinar just on grounded theory, but we just wanted to talk about that. Uh, most of the time people don't ground their surveys in theory. They are, they are kind of looking to find out information about a particular population. It makes for a much stronger survey if you're grounding it in some particular theory. We'll talk a little bit that, more about that later with an example. Uh, next slide, Lynn. Grounded theory, which was developed by Glazer and Strauss, has been written up by many different researchers, including Kathy Sharmaz, C-H-A-M. A R C H A M A Z. We have the um, uh, the. It is one of our uh, references for later, uh, and so and she talks about the idea of the constant comparative method, right? Which uh, is involves in looking at qualitative data repeatedly, seeing what categories emerge, seeing what patterns emerge, and going back and constantly comparing different pieces of data, again, with the object to do data reduction. Because what we're, what we're looking at here is trying to take a lot of qualitative data and reduce it to um, themes, categories, and examples of themes. OK. Uh, next, I want to just talk, uh, I mentioned uh, quantitative analysis, and I wanted to kind of circle back on that just for a minute, because quantitative uh, analysis uh, can be done using also um, uh, programs like SurveyMonkey, which I was just showing, and Qualtrics. Uh, Qualtrics uh, is a system that is similar to SurveyMonkey, and these will produce these descriptive statistics as I talked about earlier. The idea of descriptive statistics is you're going to summarize and describe the data. So again, mostly percentages and computing averages for the most part. Then we also have uh, the idea of uh, when, when you have limited resources, uh, and you're going to, the SurveyMonkey, of course, has a free 
version and also a premier version. If you're using the free version of SurveyMonkey, you're going to be limited in how many questions you can ask and also what is the size of the population. But it is, if you are on a limited budget, and many of you master's students and doctoral students may not have huge amount of grant money lying around for you, it's a really good option. Okay? But you're not going to be getting really in-depth analysis. If you want to do more in-depth analysis, you may want to look at um, doing more infer inferential statistics, which pr allow you to predict or estimate, es uh, estimate for large populations, uh, looking at uh, characteristics that you want to uh, delve more deeply into. Uh, and also with this idea, as Lynn mentioned, about testing hypotheses, right? So the uh, parametric um, statistics and non-parametric statistics you would use to SPSS or SAS software. And indeed, I'm sure many of you have learned about these or will learn about these in your research methods courses. If you haven't taken them, I highly, I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, the difference between parametric and non-parametric uh, has to do with the distribution. Uh, parametric statistics assume a normal distribution. What does that mean? That means you may see a bell-shaped bell curve right, uh, in your distribution. Non-parametric, it would be distribution-free. Uh, this is where you might see a, um, a chi-square, right? They can look at level testing for level of significance, okay? So um, to move onward, I want to um, then talk a little more deeply about uh, qualitative methods and coding. So uh, talking a little more deeply about coding, Coding involves looking at your data and dividing the responses into categories, then tabulating the amount of data for each category and statistical computations, again, to describe your data. Okay, So we were talking about grounded theory where your coding categories evolve from the data. And we may be looking at things like uh, setting, situation, perspective, process activity, and so on. Uh, these might uh, stem, stem from the data, and you can look for each one of these different types of data in your analysis. And that, that's also done with that constant comparison methods. Uh, Lynn, if you go to the next slide, to kind of help us think about this process uh, as a whole process, OK? So for example, in, in, in um, uh, interviews, but also if we're using survey data, if we're having open questions, right? Uh, for our open questions, we would, after we have the data, uh, um, we would be looking at our code book. So we would be looking at our code book uh, to see what themes are coming out of that uh, survey data from our open questions, building the code book, uh, loading our data into in vivo right, loading in the code book, and then as we're coding this data, what we're doing in InVivo is we're dropping, uh, so we're reading the open um, questions, the responses to them, and we're draw, dragging and dropping them into our different categories, okay? So the way that Lynn and I do it, I mentioned this earlier, we would start with coding a portion and then run an ICR uh, intercoder reliability test to make sure that we are on the same page with this. Uh, to give you a kind of an example to think about, uh, Lynn and I have been doing research where we ask an open question that we call the, the magic wand question. Okay, So right now we are doing research looking at scholarly identity, for example, uh, people's, people's use, doctoral students, faculty, and librarians, use of systems like um, academia.edu, uh, ResearchGate, and so forth for scholarly identity. And we ask, a magic, we ask this magic wand question, that if you had a magic wand, what help would you need? Uh, what, what help would you like to have 
in developing and maintaining your scholarly identity. Okay, and then if someone says, I would like to have um, the systems populate themselves uh, after I've inserted my CV or something, we would make that a category. And then every time someone mentions this in our open-ended questions, we can drop and drag that into that particular code. So that's how it's a very iterative process of looking at the data, developing codes, then looking back at more data and dropping, dragging and dropping. So coding uh, those transcripts from our uh, either interview data or also, as we're talking about today, open-ended questions from survey. And then doing the analysis uh, and in vivo, uh, exporting the results and doing those uh, descriptive calculation. Okay, so uh, Lynn, for the next slide, uh, then one of the other most uh, detailed uh, parts of evaluating questionnaire uh, um, re results from qualitative open questions is how do you how do you interpret the results, right? I mean, so if you think back about our opening survey questions, when we saw that half of you, or more than half of you, I guess it was 75 percent, are interested in designing surveys. In, Interpreting that, now again, there are many components of designing a survey, so we're not exactly sure what you want, right? But we can say, well, you know what, most of this group is interested in designing survey. We also saw that most of you uh, fell into the category of having very little or moderate experiences with surveys, so we know that we're not looking at a group of people who are all uh, highly um, skilled in this area, which gives Lynn and I some immediate interpretation of what level uh, that we need to talk to you on. However, when you have qualitative data, it's more difficult to interpret uh, what's been said with any level of of uh, precision. And one of the things we would see here is say, people say, data suggests, findings seem to indicate. That is expressing the proper degree of caution in your conclusions, okay? Uh, also using uh, data to, to go back in uh, as outcome measures. Uh, one of the other things that we have been doing over time with qualitative data is doing longitudinal studies and then comparing those results. Uh, we did transcript analysis, for example, uh, from um, 2006, 2010. We pulled a new sample in 2015 and we'll be pulling uh, new samples and then comparing those results over time, okay? So requiring that special attention. Uh, so what, to bring some of this um, to have a more concrete example. We're going to talk about the seeking uh, synchronicity uh, research that Lynn already mentioned. Lynn, if you can go to the, uh, actually go to that slide and then we can go straight to the next slide. Seeking Synchronicity was funded by the IMLS, Institute for Museum, whoops, no, back up one. Uh, if you see in the corner there, was funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, OCLC, and Rutgers, and we have a research site, and the report, uh, Seeking Synch Synchronicity Report, is available for free download from OCLC. You could actually just put into Google OCLC Seeking Synchronicity, and you can, you can access and download it there. Uh, so what we were looking at there are ideas our uh, goals of the research were to look at virtual reference, so live chat from librarians, users, and non-users. Uh, we conducted focus group uh, inter interviews, we analyzed transcripts, and then we did interviews and online survey. One of the techniques that we used was the critical incident technique. Next slide, please, Lynn. The critical incident technique uh, comes out of uh, marketing and social science, and it asks uh, people to re think and remember something that was very um, important to them and focusing on a most memorable experience. This was first written about by Flanagan way back in 1954 and allows categories to emerge rather than be imp imposed. So next slide, Lynn. For, for the example, uh, in our online survey questions, this would be um, the, the positive critical incident would be 
uh, and you can think about this for yourself. If you've ever used live chat reference, think about one experience that you achieved a positive result. The negative a critical incident question would be for you to remember an experience when you used virtual reference when you did not achieve a positive result. And then we ask people if they can remember something, describe it, describe why you, why you felt the encounter was successful or unsuccessful. Did the chat format help your experience to be successful? If yes, how? And we actually had people just typing this in to a survey, an online survey. So it was all collected online. Uh, so um, we also had, so these were for our VRS users. And Lynn, next slide. Similarly, for the non-users, we had questions uh, that asked them uh, to, to think about experiences in library reference services in any format. So if they used a face-to-face -face traditional library service or phone service. Uh, or any you know uh, other other service that they had used. Okay, so then um, uh, finally, when 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 we have this kinds of questions, then if you move to the next slide, you can see the different. This is the type of data that we got back. So um, the so for example, one of the VRS users said, um, so this would be a positive result. The librarian threw in a cordial sign-off, encouraged me to pursue the reading. It was like talking to a friendly librarian in person. Okay, So this was, again, they typed them into the survey. Uh, one of the uh, good advantages there, we did not then have to transcribe anything because we asked online. right? And so then looking at this, if you want to think of analysis, what category uh, would this uh, be coded into? Right? And one of the things that we had uh, devo developed over a long time, long time with this type of research is this idea that there are facilitators or positive things that help with these encounters, but there are also negative things or barriers. So this one, because they're talking about a cordial sign-off and a friendly librarian, we would, catalog, we would categorize this as something very positive, and it's actually talking about the attribution of the librarian, right? And, and we could also further talk about this as being on the relationship side, the interpersonal side, rather than the person saying, well, they gave me the information I needed. So those are the ways that we would look at some of this open-ended uh, research. So this research project, Seeking Synchronicity, actually, as I mentioned earlier, had four different phases and did take a mixed methods approach. And I'm going to turn this back over to Lynn to talk about mixed methods research. Mixed methods is any combination of research methods. So you can have qualitative, quantitative, participatory, action, design. Uh, so any of these, and you pull them all together to, to actually create a complete or almost complete picture of the situation that you're studying. The key point here is that equal attention has to be given to all of the different research methods and processes. And also, the findings should be iterative and informative. And this comes from Kazmer. Uh, she wrote a text box, a section in the research methods book that Marie and I co-authored. And by the last bullet point, findings should be iterative and informative. That means that the, the findings need to um, play off of each other, uh, complement each other, and this is very important. Triangulation, obviously that's um, you know three, the triangle. It was a term uh, actually coined in 1966. Uh, by Webb, Campbell, Schwartz, and Seacrest. And they call, their book was Unobtrusive Measures, Non-Reactive Research in the Social Sciences. 
and they talk about multiple methods of data collection and analysis. And so you can have interviews, you individual or group, observation, you have your literature, your archives. The results should agree, or at least they shouldn't contradict each other. And if they do, then you need to go back. Again, this is iterative. You need to go back and look at where the discrepancies are, what may have caused them, and you may have to start over and collect additional data. The other important thing to remember is that in this type of research, you almost always need multiple investigators, so collaborators. Why? Because we're not all experts in every area. And you need to be looking at multiple context situations. So uh, these are things to think about when you are looking at mixed methods. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Miles uh, Huberman and um, uh, Miles and Huberman. And, but Miles um, Huberman and Saldana, they also um, wrote a book in 2014 about qualitative analysis. And they point out that although designing and conducting a mixed method research project involves careful planning and more effort and execution, the benefits outweigh, greatly outweigh the difficulties. So basically, what they're saying is it takes it can take more time and you can you can't do it on your own and anyone who has been involved in team projects or collaborative projects or research know that sometimes it's much easier to do it yourself but with mixed methods you cannot so it takes a little more time and effort but in the long run, your findings can have much more impact and also broader scope. So those are things to remember. Looking at survey research in terms of mixed methods, uh, survey development, the whole survey process can, can follow or um, so it can be informed by other data collection methods. So you can have interviews and then follow up with surveys, or focus group interviews, or an experiment. And what we have done in the past is we interviewed individuals, we had semi-structured interviews, and then we also had either monthly interviews with a select group of individuals, or diary submissions for several years. And then we conducted a survey, and this was US-UK, so that we could determine if our small sample, but for a qualitative study it was not so small, but 73 individuals, if those 73 individuals were an anomaly, because it was a purposive but snowball sample, and or if it was reflective of a larger population. So we followed up with those uh, semi-structured interviews and diaries or monthly diary discussions with an online survey of 150 individuals from the US, UK, and asked some of the same questions. And we found that the responses were very similar. And so in that case, we thought, felt much more comfortable with what we found with that smaller group. Survey research also um, can help you overcome limitations of some of the qualitative research methods. Because as I just said, it can be administered to a more random sample of a larger population. And it gave us, when we did this, the ability to generalize our results but it also confirmed our results from our qualitative research findings. So, um, and this study that I'm talking about is called the Digital Visitors and Residents. 
and we just um, came out with an OCLC report on that. And so this is a great example of mixed methods. And Marie and I have done that with Seeking Synchronicity as well. Now, these are some of the justi justifications for combining these mixed methods. So I talked about this triangulation. It's that co um, corroboration, the correspondence, the results from different methods uh, that hopefully support each other. And if not, the researcher needs to determine why. It's complementary, so it can enhance and clarify the results from one method um, with the other. It can help you develop uh, or inform the other or the next process of the, of the research. So with us, um, sometimes we will do focus group interviews. Marie and I have done this with, we did this with Seeking Synchronicity, conducted focus group interviews because we needed to know more about how individuals are interacting with virtual reference services. And then we followed up with broader online surveys with a larger population. Also, uh, we, this whole initiation of uh, new ideas, Theoretical frameworks with seeking synchronicity. We came up with another uh, a theoretical model. So this is very helpful in those areas. And then it also expands or extends the breadth uh, and depth of our initial research, which I also discussed. So some of the key questions when implementing these mixed methods and multi-strategy research, you need to be sure, um, are the methods employed simultaneously or, or sequentially? So that means, are you going to be using one to inform the other? So are you going to do the focus group interviews first to inform how you're going to develop the survey, or are you going to do them at the same time? And it depends on your questions and if it's exploratory, what you know. Uh, also, if you're going to do one first, which method has priority or goes first and why? And um, why are you using mixed methods? So don't just do it to do it. So you need to know why. We did it because with Seeking Synchronicity because we started out with an exploratory project. And then once we got more information, we felt more comfortable trying to solicit and, and developing questions and soliciting the answers from a broader population. With the digital visitors and residents, we had a lot of data with a small group of people, and we wanted to see if we had an anomaly, or if these results were something that could be replicated in, um, a, 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 to a larger pop population. Again, our quantitative and qualitative data collected simultaneously or sequentially, and you need to look at data analysis. So we use the same code book for data analysis for the different data collection methods. Are you going to develop a new code book for each type of um, data collection method that was used? And to me, if you want to integrate and have this mixed method approach, that I feel it's very important that the data analysis is integrated in some way. But this is a, a personal question. And it's dependent upon your research questions and your research design. OK. Looks like my microphone is working. Yay! <laughs> We're always excited when the technology works. I just typed into the chat box. I'm going to be the last section of our webinar today. We're going to be talking about the presentation of findings. So if you have questions along the way about um, any analysis 
uh, that the section I talked about or the mixed me methods se section or anything that we've covered so far, please start thinking about them and feel free to start typing them into the box as I'm talking about the presentation of findings. So ultimately, Lynn, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, so one of the things that, um, uh, as I was saying, uh, we're not just for doing uh, research, although it is fun, and that is a big secret about research, <laughs> how fun it is to do research. <laughs> My students <laughs> always tell me later, you know, you were right, it really is fun. But in addition, we want to disseminate our results. So that means we are going to have to write up a research report. And I know that many of you are doctoral students, or if you're master's students and you may be contemplating um, a publication, we'll talk a little bit here about the research report. So the idea of the research report is that uh, this is what you're going to do to let readers know about what research you have conducted and what did you find. So um, the objectives of the report is to let people know first about the problem. What did you um, research? Why did you do that research? What is the most important uh, significance? Why? That's kind of so what? So what? Why is this problem? important. Uh, and then also, uh, you want to explain your results, your implications, and of course, again, circling back, what is the importance of your results. And generally, we think about the research report as written, uh, it's a written document, but obviously can also have graphic components and may result in presentations at conferences, in your classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what are the components of the research report? Lynn, next slide, please. Uh, so um, in, in our book that Lynn and I have been talking about, the Research Methods in Library and Information Science, uh, we, we actually put a whole chapter in writing up uh, uh, and talking about dissemination of results. So I'm, we're just going over this you know, rather quickly today, but it's very important. And it does all kind of come together where when you start with your uh, literature review to begin with, you then prepare your questionnaire, administer it, uh, look at what are the results, and then interpret those results. So the research report should have uh, these following parts, right? So um, not only the literature review about what has been found after the introduction and problem, but also what conceptual framework. This goes back to the idea of were you going to use a theoretical foundation to begin with, or were you going to start with a grounded theory project where your result is to try to start to um, um, develop some theory, or are you in using this questionnaire, this survey, to inform another part of a larger project and a mixed method study and so forth? Uh, so you have to report your design. What did you do? And so one of the important things as we are conducting our research is to carefully document all of our decision points along the way, right? If we used, if you had a bunch of coders, you have to report this in your design and methodology, and then in your results, you have to report, if you have open-ended questions, your intercoder reliability and so forth. You have to make summary, you have to make conclusion, and then obviously the reference and bibliography. Now, the, important of the, rep the importance of the report is that this is going to stand after all of your hard research, and I mean your hard work, Lynn and I, some of these projects like Seeking Synchronicity was a three-year a grant where we worked very, very hard with multiple strands. And what stands now is that report that I talked about right at the end. You know, what are people going to see of all of that work? We publish a lot of papers, obviously, we're citing it in our books, but the report stands as a really important um, output. And we can't emphasize enough how important it is to be clear, to make sure that all of these components are there, and to write clearly so that other people can understand uh, what you did and what you found. Uh, next slide, please, Lynn. 
uh, one of the things that Lynn and I have found is that graphics are also important. And I mean, if you just think about our presentation today, uh, uh, how much uh, our, our graphics uh, did add to your enjoyment of our report today, if you will, about uh, survey research. So graphics can help present information and data more clearly and succinctly. Uh, so again, think about our, our, our little poll questions at the beginning. You could see people entering the data. You could immediately see because they were simple and clear right, what was going on in that data. So when you then go to represent that data, uh, you might want to think what graphics do you, do you want charts, do you want a bar graph, do you want a pie chart, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, there has been loads and loads of work on design, but this, this very simple advice of clear, simple, accurate, uh, Self-contained means that you should be able to look at the graphic and you shouldn't need five paragraphs of explanation to understand what is the, being presented in that uh, graphic. And then you should also always reference it in the text, as you can see in the table below, blah, 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 and so forth. And if you look at our um, that research report, the uh, Seeking Synchronicity Research Report that I referenced, you will see that it's full of, of graphics to help uh, illustrate the findings from that uh, very extensive research project that we did. Uh, as far as oral reports go, uh, Lynn, next slide. Uh, there's a lot of very basic information about doing an oral presentation, any kind of presentation. Uh, make a plan. Uh, obviously, the importance of practice uh, and, and, and uh, doing the, your presentation in front of someone else, right? Uh, important to making an initial impact, which means how do you start your presentation? Uh, do you greet the audience? Hello. Do you thank people who invited you uh, for speaking that day? Uh, establishing a rapport with your audience. And I can't tell you how many times people have started presentations that I have witnessed where they don't even have the attention of the group. So you want to wait until you have everyone's attention. If people are still coming in, milling around, getting snacks or whatever, invite everybody to sit down and wait until you have everyone's attention. It's very, very simple because once you start talking, if people are still talking, you will lose that initial impact, which is so, so important. Stick to your few key points. Sometimes in a presentation of research, Lynn and I have experienced this, you might get 12 minutes, 12 minutes to talk about a presentation where you have worked years, perhaps if you're talking about a dissertation, uh, many years, so forth, and you might have a very limited amount of, of, um, of time to talk about your presentation. So you have to make sure that you have your key points and think about what's, what's most important. Uh, you don't want to do a presentation where you've ended your presentation and you still have 20 slides left to go, or you've rushed through your slides because you overestimated how much you could cover. Uh, like the initial impact of the beginning and making a strong statement of the beginning of your, at your beginning of your presentation of what your problem is, why is it important, a strong conclusion is also very important. Uh, some public speaking experience even is, is uh, very important in the beginning of your career and throughout your career, ending on a a positive note to say, here's our conclusion, this is what's important to us. Lynn gets to do this in a minute, so I can just <laughs> I can just relax after this last slide. Uh, allowing time uh, for, for uh, questions and discussion, uh, as we will at the end of our presentation. Uh, try to be confident and enjoy yourself. Be yourself as much as possible in the presentation. Uh, allow yourself uh, to uh, respond if something happens in the audience and so forth. Um, and if somebody does shout out a question even inappropriately, uh, you can say, hey, hang on to that question. We'll be getting to the Q&A period rather than getting all flustered and so forth. Uh, and I do see that there is one question, but I'm going to turn uh, anybody other questions, please type them into the chat box. I'm going to turn um, 
uh, the microphone back over to Lynn. Okay, thank you, Marie. And I'm just going to end with um, a few quotes. And the reason that I like this, this is by Carlton Cuse. And it says, the creative process is not like a situation where you get struck by a single lightning bolt. You have ongoing discoveries and there are ongoing creative revelations. Yes, it's really helpful to be marching toward a specific destination, but along the way you must allow yourself room for your ideas to blossom, take root, and grow. And I think sometimes with research, we have a research plan and we want to stick to it no matter what. But sometimes you have to take detours. And, and, those, and those detours may provide for you some of the best findings and knowledge that you'll get in that project. An example is, um, with Seeking Synchronicity, Marie was conducting the focus group interviews first. And she conducted focus group interviews with screenagers, the 12 to 18 year olds. And afterwards, she called me and said, Lynn, there were things here that we had never anticipated. And these individuals think differently than others who we have interviewed. And so she said, you know, we really need to, to do more and talk to more of these individuals in this, this the screenager group. And so what we did is we took a little detour and when we conducted, um, we conducted more focus group interviews, and then we made a very targeted effort to include in our surveys the participants who were in that demographic area. And so that was very important to our research, and we came up with some different analyses, different papers, different reports based on that. So um, don't just be myopic, be open to what you're learning and take detours when necessary. And this is from um, Ellen DeGeneres. When you take risks, you learn that there will be times when you succeed and there will be times when you fail and both are equally important. And you, you know, I always tell when I'm working with young um, early career um, new researchers, I. It seems like they'll say, well, we failed. Now what do we do? You never really fail. If you've learned something and you've learned how not to do something, then, then it's not a failure. And you need to tell people about that, report that, so that others can either say, oh, did you think of this, or uh, won't do or make the same mistakes as you. So it's really not a failure. You did learn something. You did discover something. A perfect example was when we were collecting diary information for the Digital Visitors and Residents Project. What we received was minimal and not very useful. Why? Because I didn't read the chapter in the research methods book that, again, talked about diaries. We wanted to be very open-ended, and so we did not want to put restrictions. And so we were, and what we got was information that was not useful. But when we pulled back and became much more specific about what we wanted in those diaries, then we got richer information. And so it wasn't a failure, it was, you know, it, it was a learning experience for us. And so uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And um, I haven't been able to see the questions, so I'm going to stop sharing soon and, uh, so that I can also read the questions. Um, I want to acknowledge Brittany Brannon um, because she helped us present this, and also IMLS since they funded the Seeking Synchronicity project. Uh, we have a list of references and attributions for all of the images, and um, I will uh, ask that we have this posted on the OCLC research slide share. So um, if you um, I think you know that would be uh, something else where if, if you want to look at this further, um, you will be able to. We had one question about um, the difference between the distinction between 
mixed methods and multi-methods, <laughs> which I just kind of typed in a quick answer that it's the same thing, because uh, frequently uh, mixed methods have a whole bunch of different uh, terms that could be used, used for it. How rampant is mixed methods, methods used in LIS? Looks interesting, but we were not taught that in grad school. Wish we had this course. Thanks for the brilliant presentation. Yay! <laughs> You're welcome. That mixed methods is becoming much more widely used in, in LIS. Uh, and you will see uh, focus groups followed by a survey, or the other way around, uh, a survey research that's then followed, followed by a different kind of method that's used. In my opinion as well, editors of journals, if you are looking to submit uh, that they want to see more complex research than just uh, a, a bland survey, especially if there's no theoretical framework for your survey, so kind of a, a theoretical survey where you just surveyed a population about a particular problem, uh, not that it's not um, valuable research, but that your odds of getting that published might be better if you also gave uh, uh, additional uh, data in triangulation, as Lynn was saying. So when individuals answered with other, I'm assuming you did not have please right. explain. Um, but that, that's something that you should do. Other is great, um, but then you should have something that says, please explain or explain. And you can also structure the online survey, if it's an online survey, that individuals can't move to the next question until they fill in that explain or please explain comment section. I think if you are able to contact the individuals, again, you may try, but I, I think that's a long shot. This highlights uh, the importance of the pretest, the survey pretest, which Lynn also talked about, uh, um, that before you administer a survey to a large number of people, make sure that you get a bunch of people, you know, two or three at least, to pretest it. And you might find out then that already that those people are answering other. So uh, that's, that just shows up the importance of the pretest. Uh, one of the things that annoys me the most about surveys I have taken is that either they don't have an other category, right? So that you get four choices, but none of those actually, you know, and if you noticed in our survey poll, we were giving the other. Uh, so are you a doctoral student? Are you a master student? Are you, are you, do you already hold the doctorate or other, right? Um, and so it annoys me if there's not that other um, thing to click on. But then also it annoys me if it doesn't allow you to also say what your other answer is, right? So uh, that's really important for survey design. Good question. Well, there's several ways to do this. I always want, I always am interested in seeing the questionnaire. Some people may not be. Uh, if you want, um, and this is something we've done, you, you may include a link to that questionnaire. So you can refer to it in your um, published article um, from the conference and have a link, or something else that Marie and I have done and many other people do, you can add an appendix. Sometimes uh, Lynn and I, uh, we will post it on our, uh, on our website. So for Seeking Synchronicity, which was a big grant, we could refer people to the website to get long, especially if it is a long questionnaire. So uh, there are other ways to do it. Uh, there are other ways to make that available. If there's conference proceedings, uh, sometimes you are able to put it in there as well. Uh, that's another option if you have that option. Uh, but you might be limited by conference proceedings by the length. So if you have a very long questionnaire, uh, what, one of the other things too, I think we didn't really talk that much about, uh, Lynn, Lynn touched on it briefly, that people are, people's time 
is very valuable. You can think of your own time. And if time is short, do you really want to design a long questionnaire, right, to begin with? Because are you then going to get a good response rate? So we found that if you can keep it, keep the questionnaire to a reasonable length, you will allow more people to respond. And also, if, if you do need a long questionnaire, maybe you really want to do a, an interview. Maybe what you really need <laughs> in, a, in not a long uh, written questionnaire or online questionnaire, but actually to conduct in-depth interviews. You do have Lynn in my uh, email address. We're both actually extremely easy to find. <laughs> I invited you to um, follow us on Twitter. And also, I invite you to submit your work uh, to the LIDA conference. I'm co-chair. I put in the, uh, the information. It's at the University of Zadar uh, in Croatia. And I don't know where many of you are located. I know that it's not all that far uh, from you if you are in Germany or surrounding countries. And we are still have an open call for posters for students showcase, which includes master's students, and for the doctoral form. And I sent the um, URL in chat, but you can also just uh, um, you can just Google uh, Lida 2018, and both Lynn and I are going to be there. And Lynn, I so I will say goodbye, and I'll give Lynn the last word here. Well, I, I just uh, want, want to thank everyone for joining us. And as Marie said, if you have questions, you can let us know. And I will ask that this be posted um, on the OCLC Research Slide Share site so that if you want to look at the references or we have very detailed notes, they're available there. That was our first webinar on survey methods with our two great speakers, Lynn and Marie. Thank you both so much, you really rocked it. And of course, also thank all our participants. We also hope you enjoyed the webinar organized by the European Student Chapter of ACES. And if you don't know what ACES or the European Student Chapter is and you want to find out more, please feel free to approach us anytime via our website or of course also Twitter. And this is also where you will find this recorded webinar. And we are always happy to welcome new members and to make friends. And this is so far from us. We hope we will see you soon again. Thank you so much.